mentioned. I had it in my PowerPoint. I didn't put it up, but I talked about where Paul says, I beseech you, be followers of me. And um, so as he, let me just kind of make sure I am where I'm supposed to be. Look, some of the things that Paul is saying to them, people think that they take that to be sarcastic. Uh, you, you are full, you are rich, you have reigned without us. There may be, there may, I don't know that there is. I don't know that there isn't. There may be a touch of that, but here's the thing I want to make clear. Paul does not see them as adversarial. In fact, he talks about, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not saying this to, um, he basically said, I'm not saying this to hurt your feelings. I'm saying this to, to warn you as my dear children. That's the way Paul views the relationship. And he views himself as a father to them. Why? Because he's the one that brought them the gospel. That's why they got, got saved in the first place. I, th I think Paul believes that he has enough influence with them that when he says, be ye followers of me, that they will that will mean something to them. Now, that doesn't mean they'll all instantly run out and do that. But I, I do think Paul believes there is enough connection there for him to be able to talk to them. And if those things, now ye are full, ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. If that sounds a little sarcastic, that may be why Paul says, I'm not saying these things to shame you. But he does know that that kind of language will catch their attention. If, I, if I'm really friends with someone and I do something dumb or say something, you know, that's not wise, and they give me a little bit of a barb over that, but you know what, and, but I know they love me, and they're not just doing it to be, you know, evil toward me, that has an effect. It makes you think, wait a minute, you know what, maybe I need to stop and look at this. You know, and so I think there is a little bit of that going on. Okay, so uh, the so the the Corinthians are living a life of ease. I think I, I think we need to appreciate that. But the apostles are not; they are suffering. And uh, and when Paul says you have reigned as kings without us, that is a reference, as I said to you at the end of the last one. That's a reference to the apostles. So the Corinthians thought they were really enjoying life without Paul and the rest of the apostles. But they were thinking that was a great thing. Um, okay, and so I talked to you about Paul being uh, like a father to them. And we, we did that verse. And then I talked about where he says, be followers of me. And that's the verse that's up now. And here's where he says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved son. See, I think Paul's still looking at them very affectionately and not in an adversarial position. He knows they're not doing the right thing. But you know what? But he knows he knows who they are in Christ. And now he's trying to uh, plead and exhort with them on that basis. So he says, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. That's, and, and so they're supposed to take it just that way. All right. Now that, that brings us to the correction portion of the doctrine. So that was verse eight. Now we're going to start with verse nine and read the correction portion. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Now, I want to go back to verse 9 and pick up how Paul starts this out. He says that God has set forth us, the apostles, last. Now, look, there, there, there is something happening. And I, I think the picture that Paul has in mind here is that of when an army goes out and it conquers another army and they take those spoils when they parade back into the city you have the, ar the, the victorious army coming in first, and then you parade the spoils, and then the last thing in the procession are all of the prisoners who are in shackles that are coming in, and they're going to be put into the arena or the Colosseum, and guess what? They're going to be put to death. Paul says, God has set forth us, the apostles, last. That's what I think he's, that's what I think he's referring to. In other words, this is how 
we're being looked at by the world and unfortunately by believers who think like the world. That we don't want anything to do with this lifestyle of the apostles. And that's why he says the apostles last as it were appointed to death. So that scenario that I unfolded for you, I, I think that's what, what's going on there. And by the way, you might say, why? Why would God allow that to be for the apostles? But I think he tells you in the last part of the verse, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. There is something that God is making manifest by the apostles and the way they are responding to the sufferings that are in their lives. Okay, now, having said that, um, by the way, if there's something interesting about the way this starts out. God has set forth us, the apostles. I, you, can, you can get this meaning out of that. Paul is not saying, I chose to live this way. This is the life I wanted to have, whether I was an apostle or not. This is I, No, that's not what he's saying. He is saying because of what is required of him as an apostle who is going to be faithful to the Lord, which, by the way, would be true of anybody, even if they weren't an apostle, if they were faithful to the Lord. He's saying God has set forth us, the apostles, in this way. See, I, I don't want you to read this passage and say the Corinthians chose this kind of life and the apostles are choosing a different kind of life. They're not choosing a lifestyle. What they're choosing is to be faithful ambassadors of the truth, and this lifestyle is the result. Everybody with me there? And so I see that terminology, I think, kind of indicates that, that it's, it's not just, well, Paul said, I, just, I think I like it better when people are beating me up and, and I'm left for dead on the side of the road. I kind of enjoy that. So this is the life I've chosen. Okay. So yes, that is a little bit sarcastic, but I say that not to shame you, but to warn you. Okay, so, um, and the truth is every believer, if they were faithful, would be experiencing the same things that the, that the apostles were experiencing. And that's why Paul says, hey, you, I, I, I do want you to follow me. Isn't that a bit of a thing? When Paul lists all the things that are happening in him, and he says, I would love for this to happen to you too. <laughs> now, when I say it that way, it makes you think, oh, Paul wants them all to suffer. No, he wants them all to be godly. Okay. This is where the real end of that first session was. And now I'm just going to bring us on up. Verse 10, where Paul says, we are fools. For... Now, by the way, that was those sufferings. And you notice I did not take time to go through all those sufferings. But that is really close to that list in Romans chapter 8. For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Boy, a whole lot of things in that list are just like that list that we just saw in 1 Corinthians. Mm. You just, one day, stop and think about that. When Paul says, we are buffeted, what does that mean? That doesn't mean they went to Golden Corral. <laughs> Not hardly. Not hardly. That means what? Yeah, they, they've been beaten. They've been beaten. And without, with no certain dwelling place. You know how we'd say it today? Homeless. Do you, I'm going to tell you what the Corinthians were doing. They were looking at Paul that sometimes was hungry and thirsty and naked with no certain dwelling place. And they were looking at that and they were saying, not only is that not for me, but that is a disgrace. How in the world does that guy think he's serving God? I'm just saying that. Something to think about. Okay. Um, so verse 10. We are, so we're going to get there. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we are despised. And here's these three contrasts that Paul lays out between the apostles and the Corinthians. And we are going to talk a little bit more about those six sufferings here in just a moment. But the lost world, to, and he's speaking as though this is the way the world sees them. He's not saying we are fools. He's talking about the way they are being perceived by the world at large. And since the Corinthians are really after the world's approval, 
they're going to look at it the same way, that Paul is foolish in this. He is weak and, and he is uh, despised. Okay, so take a look at this in verse 11 now. Even under this present hour, and I didn't highlight that, but let me just say what Paul is saying is, since the time I was with you until the writing of this letter, nothing has changed. See, some people look at that and they go, well, all those things happen to you, but once you mature and, and, and kind of grow in grace a little bit, all of that will fall away. Paul never teaches that. Now, I almost hesitate to tell you, the more you grow in, grow in grace, the more the persecution is. And I know that this will seem odd, but I've actually had people say to me, hey, when we were first talking about sonship and talking about the policy of evil, it really scared me. And it kind of made me think, maybe I don't want to go whole hog on this because of what's waiting. I understand that. But once you understand the provision that's been made for you, I, I think it changes all that. Okay, and it did, and it did for them too. So even under this present hour, he said, I, it's still, to the day I'm writing this, it's still happening this way. We both hunger and thirst. Remember what I told you this was about? This was about correcting their ungodly thinking in connection with the sufferings of Christ. What are the sufferings of Christ? The sufferings of Christ are the attacks that are brought on by the policy of evil to stop Paul in his ministry, to either get Paul to be quiet, to get him to corrupt the message, or to discredit him so no one will pay any attention. And the policy of evil is determined to try to thwart Paul at every turn. And so as a result, Paul is saying, we both hunger and thirst and are naked. If you're naked, what does that, I mean, what does that really imply? I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and I don't have any clothes. Why? Because the policy of evil is so impacting Paul's life that these are the, that he finds himself going to sleep at night hungry, finds himself along the roads thirsty. And do you think if Satan has anything to do with it when he stops someone and asks for water that they might say no? In fact, I'm going to show you a real good indication in this list of that. Our naked and our buffeted, I think Paul got beat up a lot. He certainly got stoned at Lystra and have no certain dwelling place. Paul can't take his little red wagon and go home because he evidently doesn't have one. And labor working with our own hands. Now, I looked at that one and I thought, why is Paul talking about that one in a list of the sufferings of Christ? And I wondered about that. So I'm going to try to talk about it in this framework because Paul's not against work. You understand that Paul says, if you don't eat, I'm sorry, if you don't work, you don't eat. So he's all for work. By the way, did, did Paul have an earthly vocation? He was a tent maker, wasn't he? Yeah, but that's the point. Did Paul have what you would call a pretty full ministry? Look, I just look at that guy and I think, I think Paul was on the go all day long. He's traveling. Just look at a map and see where he travels. He didn't take Amtrak. He was on a boat or he was walking. That is a lot of walking. Just look at those trips across Asia. That's an incredible thing to do. I think there are times when Paul goes to sleep at night completely wore out. And, I, and I've had a few times in my life where I felt like I got there. I can remember when I was in seminary, I worked at uh, Henderson Clay Products in Henderson, Texas. That was a, one of the largest brick plants that everything was under one roof in, in North America. It was huge. And uh, we learned how to jig brick. brick. The brick would go through a silicone machine, which would spray stuff on it to waterproof them. <laughs> And then those would come down a conveyor belt. I, I just want to give you the idea of this. They would come down this conveyor belt that only the supervisor could turn off. And you had four jigs, two on each side at the end of that. So guys were up here. You had a forklift come and bring a hack of brick and you'd set it down and they'd be, you had spats. They didn't do gloves. They just did the, the, this part of the hand, it had a strap that went across the back and you would pick those up. Because if you pick up brick all day without a glove on, you won't be picking up anything the next day. Because all that skin will be wore down. It'll be just nerves right there. 
So you're picking, they're picking up, you got two guys down there and they're putting bricks on as fast as they can go. And that thing's taking them through the silicone, spraying them. They're coming out the other end and you got two guys in the jigs back here. And the one is up front and the other's got two here. He's in the front one. You got two there and he's in the back one. And this guy's going to catch all the bricks he can get and fill up his jig. And then he's going to step back to this one. And that guy's going to go to the front. And he's going to catch all he can. And any that the front guy in front misses, the guy in the back catches and puts in his. And those had to be layered across, 11 across, face up. A piece of paper went down. The next 11 face down. Then you had to build two and two in the middle, two and two on the side, two and two. A little board went across that. The next bricks went face up. And that became the holes for the forklift to come in once those got banded. The forklift would come in and move that whole uh, jig of brick out of there. And I mean, it's just coming. And for every brick that came off the end of that, if it fell on his face and chipped, it was no good. It cost the company money. And they would be angry with you. And you know, and there were still toe boots and you weren't those spats. And I can remember wearing out a pair of those real thick leather spats every other day. And you're in there. And I remember when I first started doing that, I remember guys that would take those bricks, no kidding, take those bricks 11 at a time, squish those together, bring those off the belt like this, flip those down, put them down. There's a whole row of 11, just like that. Throw the paper down on top of it, shove them together, break them at 11, pull that off. It was an amazing thing to watch. And you, know, and you have to learn that, you have to get that. I can remember going home to the dorm with steel toed boots on, falling across that bed, completely wore out. Hard hat would come off and hit the, wall and fall down beside the bed and i'd wake up in the morning when the guys woke me up and said hey time to go to class i mean i thought i need a shower it just wore me out i think i think the apostle paul felt like that a lot why he's working he's in the synagogues on sunday he's teaching that word daily to the people that he's went into cry you remember that story and that he's preaching at midnight Remember the guy fell out of the second loft, broke his neck? And, you know, that's when I, when I read that story, that's when I discovered I have more power in my preaching than Paul. <laughs> because he had to preach to midnight to get one guy to fall asleep. I can do it to half the congregation in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so I'm just saying. Okay. <clears throat> Why this working though? Because Paul's not only got a full-time ministry. Paul's Paul's got a he's got a he's got to feed himself. He's got to clothe himself. He's got to do that. And I think it's listed with the sufferings of Christ because I'm convinced that the policy of evil is working particularly to stop people from supporting Paul so he can invest his full time in that ministry. I think Satan doesn't want him to do that. Now I know plenty of guys that worked secular jobs and pastored grace churches. In fact, most of them. Most of the grace churches around this country do not have full-time guys. They're working a secular job somewhere, and then they're pastoring that church. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I am so thankful that I get to do what I do on a full-time basis. Now, have I ever worked a job and pastored? Yes. Oh, I have. Most of, most of my life, I have. But I am really grateful to be able to do this. Do you know why? Because I can invest more time in this now than I ever could have before. It would be really difficult to do this work. Now, in the old days where you're just doing sermons, I mean, you know what? You can kind of make that work. But if you're, if you're, if you're, son, if you're doing sonship, this, this requires a little more work for me. So anyway, I'm really thankful for that, really glad for that. Okay, so now, <clears throat> oh, I was talking about being worn out. Can I show you this one? Because I, I, th I think of two people when I think of people that just work themselves to a frazzle. I think it was the Apostle Paul, and I think it was the Lord Jesus. And I want to show you why I think it was the Lord Jesus, because this takes us over to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And he's talking about the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. In other words, Jesus had actually stood in the ship. The crowd was so great, they put him in the ship and pushed him off from the shore so he could teach everyone without them just crowding him out. So anyway, he was already in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. 
and there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that now it was now full. This thing is about to sink. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, carest not that we perish? How tired do you have to be to be in a boat that's about to capsize from a storm and you're just sleeping? Now, I don't think Jesus was too worried about it, but look, I, I just think he's wore out. I, I do. I, do you remember on the night that he was betrayed? You know what? Watch and pray. And how long is he? he he's an hour. And when he comes back, what are the disciples doing? Sleeping. They're sleeping. He wakes them up and says, can't you watch and pray with me for one hour? Watch that you enter not into temptation. He goes off, he prays. He comes back, what are they doing? I think they're all just wore out. I think that's what the ministry is. So, I mean, I, I'm, that kind of ministry for sure. So, <clears throat> I want to make a point about it. So, I think he's listing it in there, not because he's saying it's the policy of evil for me to have to work. I think the reason he's in the condition that he's in and he's having to work is because the policy of evil is trying to cut off his support. And it's trying, it's trying to get Paul to either be discouraged and quit or, or have so little time to do it that he's ineffective. I think that's really it. The spiritual elite, elite at Corinth would never be beaten. And I don't think they had to work with their hands. Because when Paul said working with our hands, he's not talking about being the supervisor. He's talking about doing the actual work. Um, and so Paul, Paul gives that whole list. And I've already told you to compare that to Romans chapter 8. Okay, so now, do you want to see the doctrine at work in Paul? So I tell you, there's three more contrasts. I'm going to show them to you now, and this is wonderful. Because, see, if, if I don't think Paul would sit around and complain about this. Oh, poor me, this and that happened. Oh, I didn't get any support from the Philippians. Oh, I, the, you know, these people, they, they didn't keep their promise, and blah, blah, blah. I don't think he did any of that. But did the bad stuff happen to him? It did, and I want to show you the doctrine working in Paul. So here it is, and labor working with their own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of this world and the offscouring of all things unto this day. Now, what does it mean? Let's take the first one. What does it mean to be reviled? I'm going to give you the Oxford English Dictionary for that. To be subject to insult or abuse, to talk or criticize in an abusive, angry, or insulting manner, or to rail at. And I think this is over Paul's doctrine. I think when they hear what he's saying, I think that's exactly what they do, and they attack that message. Now, that's, that's my idea of that. I think that's the policy of evil. But Paul says that when he's subjected to this verbal abuse and insult, it, I'm sorry, let me back back up. I don't think it's the next one, is it? No, this one. Being reviled, what does he, what does he say we the apostles do? We bless. And I don't think he's talking about we don't say, well, God bless you. I don't, I don't think that's what's going on with that. And when he says, and we bless, I don't think he's trying to make up good stuff about them. When he says we bless, when we're, we're being lied about and slandered and reviled, instead, I think what he's saying when he says we bless is that he is talking to them about how this message could change their life for the better. And he might even say, you wouldn't have the kind of attitude that you have. God could change that for you. And I think that's what he's talking about there. Okay, here's the next one. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Now, I have a whole list of these, so I want to read this off because I don't want to leave anything out because I took quite a while to think about it and put it down. So, by the way, when we get persecuted, what's the number one reaction that we have to that? We think we have gained the right to persecute them back, right? But what does the doctrine tell us? I'm not saying what do we want to do. What does the doctrine tell us? Yeah, we don't render to no man evil for evil. That's not, that's not what God is calling you to do. So I want to read this because I thought it was important. If you are persecuted for talking about the mystery, um. Remember when Jacob was with us in Monahans a couple of weeks back, he told me at the house, he said, they're going to kick me out of the church. They're probably going to kick me out. And I said, why? 
And he said, because they told me I can no longer talk about the mystery or the rapture. He said, if I keep talking about those things, I'm going to be out. Well, if you're persecuted for talking about the mystery. So, Jacob, if you're listening, that would be you. If you're persecuted for living according to godliness. And there are people that don't want you to be godly because that stands in stark contrast to their ungodliness and it makes them look bad and we will not tolerate that so you have to respond to things the way i do so i don't look bad or or i'll have to say something to criticize you so that people think you're the idiot if you're persecuted because you do not follow the world's wisdom and believe me that's out there if you're persecuted because of the gospel if you are persecuted because of your allegiance to Paul's doctrine. If you are persecuted for making known the manifold wisdom of God, why in the world am I mentioning that one? Because that's the job of the church. If you are persecuted over the fellowship of the mystery, if you are persecuted for living righteously, if you're persecuted for the work of the ministry, Here's what Paul says to you. Suffer it. Suffer it. You're going to endure that. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story here. I know this is going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back and I'm not. Okay, maybe a little. No, I'm not. I'm not. So I'm in uh, this Friday, I'm enrolled in a program uh, that is based out of California. And uh, it's kind of a health and lifestyle type thing is to kind of help me with cardiac issues and those kinds of things you know, have happened to me in the past. And, um, and so it's a pretty uh, strict regimen and I'm going to have to report things every day and, you know, interview every day and, you know, certain things I have to do and things I can't do and all that. And then, you know, that'll put me in a better place, you know, at the end of the 12-day program. And then they actually just follow up with you the rest of the year. And um, so to do that, they want to know your medical history. So you have to fill all that out. You have to go get blood work and send that to them. You have to take pictures of yourself front and side. I felt like I was being jailed. Uh, and uh, so they do that so they can see what you look like. And then, um, then you have to answer a bunch of questions. And so uh, then, and then after you turn that in, one of the doctors on staff there looks at your stuff and then he makes an appointment with you and you do a Zoom call together. And then he talks about your specific health situation and kind of where he thinks this program can benefit you and, and, uh, and, and then you can ask questions. So when he came on today, he introduced himself and he told me a bit, little bit of his background. Here's how long I've been practicing medicine. Here's when I came to work for this program. You know, th this is how many of these, you know, programs that I do every year, you know, and he kind of giving me his credentials a little bit. And um, and so he, he looked at me and he said, and I can tell you from the things that you filled out on your questionnaire that you and I have the most important thing in common. Do you know what that is? And I went. Well, I don't really know you, so I don't know what we have in common. And he said, all right, let me ask it this way. What is the most important thing to you? And I said, well, I know this is a health deal, but the most important thing to me is my relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ that I trusted as my Savior. And he went, bingo. That's the most important thing that we have in common. And now I will be able to deal with you, not just strictly from a secular health standpoint, but from the standpoint of someone who has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, well, why don't we do this sooner? So then he goes, and I'm looking at the answers to your questions. And he said, and question number eight, your answer. He said, in all my years of doing this, and I do this all year, all year long, I have never seen anyone answer that question the way you did. And that is the best answer I've ever seen in my life. And I thought, Question eight. <laughs> and so he read it. By the way, question seven was, he had to tell me. Question seven was, what kind of stress do you feel like you, you know, have on a daily basis from one to 10? Give a number from one to 10. 
And, um, and then it said in question eight was, how do you handle your stress? How do you deal with stressful situations? And so anyway, he said, question eight, he said, I've never seen that answer before. It's the best answer I've ever seen. And I went, question eight. And he went, how do you handle your stressful situations? He said, I'm going to read your answer. By the effectual working of God's word in my inner man and the dependence upon God's grace to allow me to patiently endure any situation to the glory of my heavenly father. And he went, that's the best answer I have ever seen. I said, thanks. He said, I've never saw that answer before. And I thought, good job, Mike. <laughs> Pleasure. You know, but yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, unless I should be exalted above measure, a thorn in the flesh was given unto me. <laughs> okay. All right, and it's sitting right back there. Okay, so, all right. Um, what was I talking about when I said that? Yeah. Uh, uh, so. It kind of surprised me that, first of all, he was so open uh, about his faith in Christ in that uh, situation, and, and actually that he understood what it was I said. And I just want to say this before I leave this illustration and then make the application. The more he talked about it, the more I thought he was a dispensationalist. And it made me wonder if he was actually a grace believer. It made me wonder. But, you know, we're, we're supposed to have a 30-minute appointment, so I'm not trying to get into a big deal. He, but he did talk to me for an hour. And finally, he said, hey, I got another patient. I got to go. I said, okay. <laughs> so he said, I got to go. I wanted to go, fine. <laughs> Do you want me to clue you in? Let me clue you in. Does it, is it okay for me to announce what you guys are doing or no? Okay. So, uh, okay. So they're engaged now. Yeah. And yeah, so they're looking to get married this year. So you can congratulate them after the service. So I just want to clue you in. When she says fine, that does not mean it's fine. Okay. And when she says, do whatever you want to do, Tannen, that does not mean you have permission. <laughs> You just need to know that. Okay. I want to interpret all of that for you. Okay. All right. It's funny how guys think, well, she told me to do whatever. Oh, please. Okay. Never make it. Okay. Um, being persecuted, we suffer it. In other words, not going to, there's no sense, no sense whining and crying about it. You just know what's going to happen, but you realize why it's happening. Because the only thing you, the, you know what you can do to make that stop. You tell me. Quit. Yeah, quit, quit, back up, change the message, do whatever. That'll all stop. Paul knows that. Here's the last one. Being defamed, we entreat. Um, now, what does it mean to defame someone? It means to slander them or their reputation in some way. You know what that is? That's discredit the messenger. That's all three of the policy of evil. That's corrupt the message. That's attack the messenger. That's if, you know, if, if we're persecuted. And then the last one is being defamed. That's discredit the messenger. Okay. So that no one will listen to him. And so he says, and being defamed, we entreat. Now, what does that mean? Being defamed, we entreat. What does that mean? It, it means that Paul is not stopping what he's saying to try to, you know, somehow, you know, revive his reputation to them. He, he, he knows what they're doing. What he's doing is he is inviting them to the truth of the gospel so that their lives might be changed. In other words, he's just, he's just saying, you need this. What I'm telling you, you need this. And they're, they're wanting to get a rise out of him so they can, you know, sidetrack that whole conversation uh, well, they're going, how dare you, you know, this mystery you're talking, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and Paul is just saying, look, this is the greatest thing that God has ever done in the history of the world. And guess what? He did it for you Gentiles. You're no longer going to have to do this through the agency of Israel, but God is now dealing directly with you. And guess what? If you'll 
uh, uh, put your faith in the finished work of Christ. You'll be a son or daughter. He'll give you all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places, all the mercies of God. He'll justify you into eternal life. He'll sanctify you unto functional life. He'll give you a glorified body one day. You'll reign with him in the heavenly place. Paul's just entreating them. He's just saying, look, he's not stopping the message. That's the idea. I'm not going to stop the message to defend myself over here. I'm just going to, if we get defamed, we just ask them to believe the message. I thought that's a pretty good formula. That's the doctrine at work. So when next time you're sitting at Thanksgiving with the rest of your family, and you're talking about the mystery or Paul, and they all want to get all, you know, huffy with you about it and, and, and criticize you about it or call you names about it, don't look, don't get sidetracked by that. Just tell them how wonderful it is. And you know what? Look at it in the Bible. And this is the greatest thing God could ever do for you. And guess what? He planned this before the foundation of the world. I mean, just, just keep giving it to them that way. Entreat them to believe that. All right. So that's the doctrine at work right there. Okay. So what have I got next here? No, I gave you that definition of revile. You know what that is. Okay. Here's what Paul, and how can Paul do that? Look, I want to show you how Paul can, if you're suffering persecution, how can you take that? So I thought, I better come back and do this. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in necessities. Here it comes. In persecutions, being persecuted, we what? Suffer it. In persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In other words, he says, I take pleasure in those, not because they're pleasurable in the experience, but because Paul is manifesting something that will prove who is the only wise God, who's the rightful possessor of heaven and earth, that, that all that God has done is the right thing. I mean, that, that's what he's doing. Something is being put on display in him in which all of that uh, is happening. Okay, so now let's move to this one. Here's the last part of that. We are made as the filth of this world and the offscouring of all things unto this day. That's either something that you wipe off or scrape off your shoe. He said, that's how we're looked at. You realize what he's doing here. That is standing in contrast to how the Corinthians, we're full, we're rich, we reign as kings. Paul says, you know what? I'm that, that slimy stuff that you scraped off your shoe. That's how you're looking at me. And you know why they're looking at him like that? Because they don't want that lifestyle. They don't want that. And, and, and Paul is making a point here to what they need to do. So here's the last part. And this has got to be quick. Because we've done the reproof. And now we've done the correction. And now in verse 14, we have the instruction in righteousness. I don't want to take the time to read that. We've already read that twice today. But you can see that now he has like changed tone. Did you notice that? He's no longer talking about the sufferings. Now he's going to do the instruction in righteousness. There is something interesting here, though. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, think in the tutor and governor issue, the instructor is the tutor. It's the guy who was over the studies, a, a wealthy family to a very well-entrusted slave. They would uh, give him the child to be instructed in his studies. And he is always pictured with a, a stick or a, a, a rod of some kind to keep the child in line and to keep him at his studies. He was stern. He was a taskmaster. And that's, that's the way that was. And Paul says, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. You know what I thought was really instructive with that? Because before he gets to the end here, he's going to give them a choice. Do you want me to deal with you like the instructor with the stick? Or do you want me to deal with you like a loving father? Let me, I'll show you the verse. So here we go. It's right here at the end. What will you? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? So Paul's kind of asking, like, we can do it either way. It's your choice. But you got to listen to what I'm saying. As my, as my beloved children, I'm warning you. That's what he's doing with that. So I thought that was really instructive. Paul is like a father to them because he has begotten them through the gospel. The whole reason they're saved is because of Paul's ministry. And because of that, he says in the next verse, be followers of me. Now, you realize that when a guy is worldly in his outlook, the last thing he wants to do is suffer like Paul. 
So the last thing he's going to do is do the things that bring that suffering on. So he likes his worldly stand. He likes to be looked upon by the world as someone who is to be admired. And then Paul is going to say in verse 17, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. I, I don't have time to talk about this fully because we're out of time, but here's the thing. He did send Timothy, but you know, Timothy was kind of mild mannered. And he went over there and he tried to love those folks. And guess what? The Corinthians did not respond to that. See, does anybody remember what Paul did? He called him back and sent Titus. <laughs> so you know what? I, I, I sent you this little puppy and, you know, hoped you would love that. But since you didn't, I'm going to unleash the pit bull on you. And that's what Titus was. <laughs> and that kind of got their attention. Here's what I want to wind up with. I sure hope I put this on the PowerPoint. Yep. So here's what I want us to get out of this form of doctrine, verses 8 to 17. The reproof is, don't think that being full, rich, and reigning is the life for now. That is the life of, of the world, and that's what the world is looking for. Paul doesn't want to be broke and beaten and hungry and thirsty, but if that's what it takes to do this work for God, then that's what it's going to be. The correction is, the godly life God wants will result in suffering. And it will. By the way, we live in an atmosphere where right now you may not be thrown into the Colosseum for that, but there are areas in this world that simply being identified as Christian may cost you your life. That's exactly where the apostles were. That's exactly where the apostles were. And in that country, you've got a choice. You can live for Christ or you cannot. You can renounce all that. And maybe they leave you alone, or maybe they don't. I don't know. But believe me when I say that in this country, it is going to get worse and worse. That is the way the dispensation of grace will come to an end. Evil men will wax worse and worse. Paul says in the last days of the dispensation, perilous times will come. You know what perilous times are? Dangerous. Dangerous. So it won't always be this good. So here's what I'm going to tell you. This is the best time to learn the doctrine where you're not being hunted down, you're having to do it in secret and, you know, hide your Bibles. This is the time. If there's a time, take advantage of this time and get the doctrine now. Because as the dispensation of Christ, it, it's going to end in apostasy. And I think Romans 9 and 10 are pretty clear about that. The instruction in righteousness, I boiled it down into a nutshell. Paul says, be followers of me. Do it the way I'm doing it. So there it is. So there is the doctrine with regard to the sufferings of Christ. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I always say that we love you and we are convinced that you love us. And we realize that there is a provision, a spiritual provision to strengthen us in our inner man when we encounter the, the various suffering circumstances of our life. And like Paul, we count it an honor to suffer for Christ's sake. And while we don't look for suffering, we want to be equipped to be able to handle it when it comes and to handle it in a way that effectively ministers to those who see us so that we are also a spectacle to men and angels in the world. But it also brings glory to you through our patient endurance of that. It is our desire, Lord, to be conformed to the image of your Son. That is not because we are weak, but it is because that is when the power of your grace is put on display. So thank you, Lord, for your provision for us in that. And may we get rooted in that truth. And may lessons like today make a difference in us when those difficult times come as we look back on what Paul was talking about here. And we thank you, Lord, for this in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for being here, folks. I appreciate that. Um, February, we'll split these sessions up. So thanks for being willing to do that. So I'll see you one more time in January before we start that up. Y'all have a great two weeks, and we'll see you then. Don't elope before.